Thank you. Thank you. Now, the, I don't know, should I shout or mic? Should I shout? Oh, no, that's right. I'll, I'll use this. I think I, oh, yeah, two, God, two hands. Oh, dear. Oh, I'll do my best. Anyway, um, yeah, great pleasure to be here and um, just <laughs> rather daunted following for you know, the, the, the previous two talks, which are really excellent. You know, and as a mere statistician, I feel, what have I got to say? Um, first of all, I'm, I'm acknowledged the hedge fund, Winton Capital Management, who pay me, uh, which is very nice of them, and got this website, Understanding Uncertainty, uh, well, I blog and things like that. Um, but I, I, you know, this, I don't really have to say this to this audience, so I'll just whip through the, why bother to communicate? I, you know, I, actually, I am gonna say this. My first reason for, I feel, Absolute ethical duty. You know, I just feel that this is I, doing the duty. You just must do it, must communicate well. And contribute to, uh, as Victor was saying, the whole discussion around informed choice. I love, love the picture of the two people sitting shoulder to shoulder, you know, engaging in a discussion. That's what I'm aiming for. I uh, influenced by the talk this morning about encouraging realistic expectations of what the benefits and harms of treatment might be. Educate health professionals. Um, I, don't, I don't make a distinction between um, patients, um, health professionals, media, and policymakers. All the stuff we work on is for all those audiences. I don't think. I think there's a much bigger division between gr the people within those groups of different levels of numeracy, for example, than there is, you know, actually between those groups. Help support networks. I love this one, encourage immunity to misleading anecdote. This has been promoted by Angela Fagelin in the States. And we all know the misleading anecdotes that we see always on social media, on, on uh, stories that we get from our friends and family. Actually, we should try to encourage some immunity to that. But the crucial thing, what is not, is to try to force people, push people into a particular course of action. And I'm going to assume that's the case. We're going to take this liberal view that we are actually hoping that people will then lead to a decision that's more congruent with their values and their deeper beliefs. Okay, balanced communication and numbers. Now, that's what I'm really concerned with. I, I love numbers. I hate, I, I think number abuse should be a criminal offence with the um, Department of Work and Pensions being serial offender in that, in that way. So I, I, I really do believe, oh, I can't spell though. <laughs> Never mind. Well, who cares? Oh, poof. Words, poof. Who cares? Um, I, the, what I mean by balanced communication, I don't mean the balance like you've got to have, like the BBC, you've got to balance, you've got to have somebody who agrees and somebody who disagrees. What I mean is that the number's not deliberately framed to make them look large or small. So what I mean by that, well, that's what I mean by that. You know, that, that's, that's a number that, that, you know, that's being just framed. The effect of the benefit of that stat is being framed using a relative risk frame. We know from endless research that that gives, a, gives an uh, over, uh, you know, impressive um, effect of its feeling about its effect. It's a very small print. You get the absolute risk down here that that's uh, a reduction 100 people essentially have to take this drug for five years to get avoid one heart attack or stroke. So th that is, it's in small print, but the big print is the relative risk reduction. So that's a manipulative frame, and, uh, yeah, and, and it's clearly so. But it happens all the time. Almost every number, I don't really want to talk about the Brexit debate, but almost every number, actually I will talk about the Brexit debate, <laughs> every number you hear in the news, somebody's either trying to make it look big to frighten you or look small to reassure you. And there, there, there's, we know I can make a number look big or small. You know, I'm expert at it. So let's, let's look at an example of that, a bit of bad risk communication, terrible risk communication. Standard one from last year, bacon, ham, and sausages have the same cancer risk as cigarettes warn experts. No, they didn't, and no, they haven't. But never mind. That's what, what the bad bit of risk communication by WHO was interpreted, at least by some newspapers. And what it meant is that processed meat was in the same category in terms of the evidence for it, that they were carcinogenic. But what they actually communicated, which is almost as bad, is a relative risk. About 50 grams of processed meat a day is associated with an 18% increased risk of getting bowel cancer. Oh, do we care? That is not evidence enough, not communicated in a way, to allow us to evaluate that evidence. We know that if we're going to interpret these relative risks, we have to know about the absolute risk. Like 6% of people will get bowel cancer during their lifetime, roughly. And so we're talking about an 18% relative increase over a six percentage points. Now, that's quite tricky. I don't know a single, oh, I was going to say, I don't know a single journalist that could do that. 
but I bet there's one sitting in the front row. I bet she could. But they can't. They ask, they ask. Um, and you have to explain, OK, that means sort of 100 people like you, smug, middle class, you know, eating your muesli and compote every morning. Actually, still, at six of you, six out of 100 will get bowel cancer during their lifetime. Let's compare it with 100 slobs every day of their lives, stuffing down a three-rasher greasy bacon sandwich down their gob. That's how many will get bowel cancer. Do you notice the difference? That's the 18% increase over the 6%. So that's 100 bacon eaters. What I call that, so the 100 is the, um, what I call the number needed to eat. <laughs> ah, great. And not finally an audience that's got the joke. Ah, oh, they've got it. You're the only audience that's ever got that joke. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. So, um, we know we can communicate that way. Okay, so how can we do it better? Well, how we do it better is by not trying to make the numbers look big or small. It's by, um, and an example of that are the cancer screening leaflets. I was on the panel that drew those up a few years ago, and they were based on consider the offer of cancer screening. They presented the pros and cons. They don't make recommendations that you go for screening. Many of you will, of course, know this, but I think in the UK, probably the UK may be unique. I don't know that its cancer screening leaflets do not recommend screening. And they're based on the idea of uniform reporting of benefits and harms, not trying to big it up, not using no relative risks, no mention of chances, percentage, probabilities. None of that language is in there at all. And the crucial thing is, the crucial thing is, and this is, you know, again, I don't think I should have to take, tell this audience, the first step of communication is to shut up. The first step of communication is to listen. That's the very first step. And bless them, they did this. We, as a citizen's jury, sat for two days, and I was presenting them with information, wasn't allowed to say what I format I liked. They then, I had to go out of the room, and they sat there with 20 pieces of paper, sorting them out into the ways they liked it, and the ways they didn't. And bless them, they chose not only the ones I would have chosen, but the ones that all the psychological research suggested they would choose as well, which is to do with expected frequencies. What does this mean for 100 women? having a mammogram. And that, that's from the, the leaflet called an expected frequency tree, showing what you'd expect for 100 women. 96 will have a normal result. Four will be, have a recall, but it doesn't mean you've got cancer. Most of the women being recalled do not have cancer. That's in the leaflet. Very nice indeed. OK, the, the other the more subtle issue, is, of course, is to do with overtreatment, which, again, people in this audience will know about. And this information is in the leaflet, that 200 women going for screening for over 20 years, these will develop breast cancer, 12 will be treated and survive, fantastic 80% survival rate, these are for the best expert estimates, three will die early from their breast cancer. Let's compare that, just like the bacon sandwich, with 200 women not going for screening, and uh, of those same number get breast cancer, eight will be treated and survive, four will die early from their breast cancer, one extra death out of those 200 women. However, three of these will never know they've got breast cancer. So that is the, the benefits of the screening, is one for your death, at the cost of three more treatments. That's 4,000 women estimated treated unnecessarily for breast cancer every year in the UK because of the screening program. Those numbers are in the leaflet. Uh, the picture isn't. It got taken out of the last draft, which I was a bit sad about. I was a bit cross about it, to be honest. It got taken out of the last draft, which was a real shame because people felt they couldn't understand it. And um, what, I, what that showed, convinced me, is this need for multi-level communication. You just can't have one size fit all. This, I know I can explain this to anybody, but on their own, it's quite tricky to take in. Um, I should say that since the publication of that leaflet, screening rates have gone down in this country. Whether it's due to that leaflet or not is a matter for debate. Okay, so um, the other thing I should say from in my professional point of view is that this idea of expected frequencies, really pushed by giga n circles, natural frequencies, um, is an is unbelievably powerful idea. And a group of us have got it in now into the GCSE math syllabus. That's 11 to 16 year old in this country, teaching probability through expected frequencies with two-way tables, tree diagrams. It's in the G. So kids in school should be able to learn how to do these things now in future. Um, to help them, we've actually had to, had to write a textbook called Teaching Probability, which is teaches probability through the medium of expected frequencies. And that's coming out in August from CUP. OK, so th uh, there's a whole process, I think, of education trying to start at the youngest level. Uh, school kids should be able to take apart that bacon sandwich story. If, if journalists can't, the school kids should be able to. 
Um, okay, I did say in my abstract I was going to talk about alcohol guidelines. I'm going to do this briefly because this is an area which I feel quite strongly about, is that which have not lived up to the standards we might expect. Okay, the, the, I won't bother to talk about the actual guidelines. Basically, in January in the UK, they said that 14 units a week, that's eight grams of alcohol as a unit, um, were, was uh, a low risk level, essentially an acceptable risk level. And um, when the, this guideline review panel, its, its publication has got a wonderful thing. It says, they, um, people have a right to accurate information and clear advice about alcohol and its health risks. The responsibility is provided citizens in an open way so they can make informed choices. I thought, yes, yes, informed choice. Contribution to discussions, brilliant. That's fine as an ethos, but it, as soon as it gets, in the whole, it gets in the hands of the Department of Health, what do they say? They say men should not drink more than 14 units of alcohol each week. A categorical statement. Abs I thought this was terrible. It infuriated me. That, you know, the guidelines had been drawn up by a panel that was, that was you know, its duty was to provide infor information for informed choice, ended up being portrayed as anything above this low risk level is unacceptable, essentially. So what they've done is taken a low risk level and suggesting that anything above it is, is high risk, is an unacceptable risk, which is actually completely inappropriate in risk communication. Okay, so I've got my little... <laughs> Got my little um, effort over. Now, lots of people are interested in this balanced communication. I'm on a working party from the Academy of Medical Sciences. This little group here, Communicating Evidence Workshop, held, was held recently, brought together people who are really engaged with this. And so, for example, I'd mention Steve Voloshin and Lisa Schwartz, you'll know from Dartmouth, who have been working on the drug facts box for years and I think, you know, have done a wonderful job basically just reporting the benefits and the harms of treatments in a, na in a natural tabular way. One of the things in risk communication research has shown is that tables are really appreciated by many people. People like tables. And especially, you know, with, you know, you can't assume that, oh, everyone wants to see a picture or something like that, or even an icon array. People like tables. Tables should be considered as a, as a, as a graphical device, essentially as a visualization, a good table. So, and, and then we've got, interact, for example, interactive Cochrane summary of findings tables. This is, um, I, was, I really suggest going and having a little play with some of these. Again, trying to take Cochrane, what's coming out of Cochrane reviews and turning it into a format which is, which is attractive and interactive, but crucially is providing a non-directive frame for the information being presented. Okay, so transparency. What I'm talking about is I love open data, I love data, I love open data, it's great. But we have to distinguish between what's these researchers, I read this is a lovely paper called fishbowl transparency, which is blah, just shoving it out there, blah, 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 you know, just massive data up to here, open data, shoving it out there. Oh yeah, we've published our data. Right, no you haven't. You really haven't. What they call reason transparency is proper communication. And one, as you'd expect, wonderful writing on this from Honora O'Neill, which says that transparency just says disclosure or dis dissemination. But this, if you're not careful, it makes you think you've done it instead of actually communicating pe to people. So what we're interested in, in and what I'm interested in now, is, is going beyond transparency, going beyond availability. And we've got a nice example, actually, that was launched yesterday of taking data that's already publicly available on the audit of congenital heart surgery in babies in this country, deeply sensitive area, and turning it into a nice website. And this website has been developed by a group of people, um, so supervised from CORU, UCL, statisticians and web design from Cambridge, psychology, randomized trials of different presentation formats and words from King's College, sense about science, facilitating the public engagement, and most important of all, Children's Heart Federation providing from the very start parents of children to be engaged in, in, the, um, in the development. Right from the day one, I've learned this now, just don't do anything until the audience, you've listened to the audiences and what they want. So this has been a long process, which I think you could go on for hours about, the choice of language, the choice of graphics, because the aim was to, to, to communicate to parents really complex, subtle information, which is summarized in this form. Um, this is three years data of congenital heart disease. What this shows is for the different hospitals in the UK, how many operations they did, how many babies died, what their survival rate was, and that's the dot. The dot is the survival rate. So you see, Birmingham's survival rate was 98%. Well, it's a sort of pretty mediocre. But you can't interpret the dot on its own. 
The dot, you mustn't do a league table on the dot. We have to take into account the severity of the cases being, being adopted. Now, this shows, the blue thing shows the predicted range. Birmingham's taking in the most, severely, the most severe cases. It's got a lower predicted range than anybody else. It's actually acting above its 95% predicted range. It's doing fantastically well. So you have to, you can only compare a hospital with what you would predict that hospital to do were it an average hospital. And we've got to have a range because we've got to allow for just random variation. Oh, you could spend ages the, the, trying to find the word for what we meant about random variation it took a year to get, to get the phrase right for that. And so, and this has been done with parents and also developed with the media as well. Um, so, because they've been so misinterpreting this data in the past. Okay, so. Ah, yes, my manifesto. My manifesto, when I'm elected, you know, president of the uh, independent republic of the UK, um, the, public, the, <laughs> the, the public professionals, policymakers, and media all have the right to receive quantitative evidence in a way that is appropriate for the decision, right level, is transparent and balanced as possible, is not manipulated to make the numbers look big or small and push people into a particular emotional response uses good design, blah, blah, and right from the start is developed in close cooperation with users and professionals. Cases for variation in the audience, particularly numeracy, not what their job is, but just how capable they are of and their wish to engage with the level of information. So it must be layered communication. And finally, fully acknowledges the uncertainty about and the limitations of the evidence. So that's the manifesto. And, uh, and finally, a bit of a plug, actually a bit of a request, um, a, my donor has coughed up a trough of money for us to open a centre to do this stuff, to do the kind of things we did on the children's heart surgery data, but in other areas as well. This, this really collaborative work. And we're, so we're forming a Winter center, Winton Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication, and we need someone to run it. So if you know anybody who would like a fantastic <laughs> job, doing this kind of stuff, please let us know. Sorry to do a job at the end of this. I'm allowed to do Yeah, of course I am. Okay, thank you very much indeed.